Iowa Hawkeye fans, college basketball fans alike. I know uh, many enjoying the Saturday round of 32, March Madness style, Iowa fans at home mourning what was a very, very disappointing end to the Iowa men's basketball season. The Iowa women will play tomorrow, but uh, I did not want to go today, given that this was such a busy weekend, and I, I fully expected to have this be one of the bigger days. This this would have been, this Saturday would have been maybe the biggest day in Iowa basketball 21st century history, right? Had they advanced to this round and won against uh, Providence to advance to the, the program's first sweet, uh, sweet 16 since 99, this very well could have been the uh, the biggest day in Iowa basketball history since, two th- since 1999. I shouldn't say Iowa basketball history, history but since 1999, I think you can make that argument. So I wanted to uh, hop on here this afternoon to rank my top five toughest Iowa men's basketball losses since 2005. Now, you may ask, why 2005? Frankly, um, I am not, uh, I certainly don't think that I am qualified to rank losses prior to 2005. 2005 was really when I really got into Iowa hoops. I'm young enough to remember um, the Steve Alford era, but boy, you you go any further back in the the Davis era and even the early Alford era, I, I really am not qualified to speak um, on the magnitude of losses or wins. And I'll say this before we get into my rankings for these losses, and I want to get everybody else's opinions on these rankings and on your toughest memories being an Iowa basketball fan. Before we do that, I want to make something clear. These are not the worst losses, okay? These are not worst losses, um, most damaging losses, just the toughest losses as an Iowa fan. And so this is completely subjective. It's completely subjective. Um, And certainly there are various factors that I use to come up with these top five. One being implications, which I just alluded to is not the sole uh, variable at hand here, but implications of a loss certainly play into this. Uh, Certainly the opponent makes makes a difference as well. And timing. Timing's a huge thing because, as you'll see with several of these losses, they were season-ending losses, and so they become uh, that much more difficult to deal with uh, as Iowa fans. Appreciate seeing Doug here. He says the Connie Hawkins Iowa basketball curse is strong. The program would be very different if they would have had his back time to apologize to his family. Northwestern uh, Big Ten Tournament 2014, same year, to, uh, Tennessee, first round of the NCAA the week. Uh, Patrick, uh, his cancer was removed from his thyroid. Tough. Great comment, Doug. So, uh, again, I don't know how long to wait into this stream before we get to the the uh, top five. So I guess we can just begin because I know we've got uh, 10 people on right now. I'd like to be able to grow that number. I know, again, a lot of people are are waiting the awaiting the start of the uh, Kansas Creighton game, which is scheduled, I believe, to get underway here shortly. Um, North Carolina, if anybody missed it, the eighth seed Tar Heels defeating the one seed Baylor. So Baylor, the first one seed to go down in overtime. And I'm not shocked by this. Certainly, uh, I did not predict that it would occur. Um, Baylor, I believe I had Baylor going to my... Final four. No, I had them going to my Elite Eight. I've got Purdue in my Final Four from that section. So, uh, congratulations to the Tar Heels. And, um, well, you feel pretty crappy if you're a Duke fan right now, I think, because although Duke is still very much alive in this tournament, it's Coach K's final year. They just got uh, blitzed by uh, North Carolina here a couple weeks ago. And now North Carolina is having success and Duke's losing its head coach. But I digress. Creighton, Kansas, going to be. Underway here in a little bit on CBS, and as we all know, uh, Richmond and Providence this evening on TNT, folks. Um, just absolutely ridiculous. I'm, I'm still just in disbelief by this loss, but we don't need to. Uh, we don't need to continue uh, lamenting. I guess we're going to kind of lament because we're going to reflect on the recent history over the past 16 years, 17 years, 17 years. My top five losses of Iowa men's basketball, the top 17 years, if that makes sense. So let's get underway with number five. And again, this is all subjective. If you disagree, that's your right. 2013, I've got these on index cards for everybody. 2013 
74 to 54 loss to Baylor in the NIT championship game 2013 20 point loss and and you may say well why is an NIT game on the docket you got to remember Fran McCaffrey had taken over just a few years prior um Iowa th- this was a magical run if you remember that NIT team Iowa went on the road won at Charlottesville against Virginia beat a really good Maryland team prior to the to uh, the Terrapins joining the Big 10 and Iowa had an opportunity to win this tournament and really launch itself into tournament consideration the following year, which they did anyways. But an opportunity at a pretty significant championship in 2013. And uh, that was that was tough. And again, implications wise, some may say it wasn't nearly as big as some of the other ones. And that's why it comes in number five. But I do believe it's a top five loss since Fran McCaffrey took over since uh, the 2005 season. Um, and certainly uh, as we go through these top five, you're going to see that I did omit a lot of lick lighter losses because how, where do you, where do you begin? Number four, number four, get focused here. 83, 82 loss at Iowa state in 2015. You may not remember this game vividly, but I certainly do. I was at this game here in Ames, in Hilton. Jared Utoff goes for 30 points in the first half. Absolutely unstoppable. Was hitting from every spot on the court. Um, Iowa builds, I believe, a 21-point lead and blows it. Iowa State uses the entire second half behind a, a forceful crowd inside Hilton to climb back into the game. And Iowa had one final chance. Mike Gasell with a missed shot to end the game. And Iowa loses again, blowing a 21-point lead to lose by one in Hilton in 2015. Now, again, this is subjective. For many people, you may not believe this is a big loss. It's a non-conference loss against a very good team in Iowa State that year. But I remember how crushing that loss was, especially given the fact that I was a huge Jared Utah fan. And um, it, it just it was just crushing. So, t- again, 2015, the loss at Iowa State is my uh, fourth toughest loss in the last 17 years. Number three. Number three. 2013 Big Ten tournament loss. First round loss to Michigan State, 59-56, a slugfest. You will recall that 2013 game. And I believe uh, an Iowa fan uploaded a video. You can watch this on on YouTube. I've seen it before. Um, some of the officiating in that game. Um, if you, I know we, you know, like to blame officials. I know there are people ranting and raving about the Richmond Iowa officials just the other day. Let me straighten out my camera here. Um, and I understand that the officiating was not good down the stretch in that game. But typically, I'm not going to blame a loss, especially that Richmond loss. That that Richmond loss was was lost on the court, Iowa just failing to uh, show up. I I don't have any other explanation as to what happened on Thursday other than they just didn't show up, whether it be physically, mentally, et cetera. But that 2013 game was absolutely stolen from Iowa. Thank you, Finn, M. Finn. It was absolutely stolen. Some of the officiating in that game was vomitous, horrendous, disgusting. Um, I, I just remember one play that stood out, and you can go back and watch some of the highlights of that game. Um, go back and watch the highlights of that game. I remember a play where Z- literally Zach McCabe is being put in a headlock <laughs> and being dragged down the court, and there's no foul call. Literally being dragged down the court in a headlock, and there's no foul call. I believe that's the game that Fran McCaffrey threw his suit jacket um, and might have actually – I think he pounded on the scorer's table in that game as well. So, again, 2013, the 59-56 loss – Versus Michigan State. And the other reason why it was so big, major implications that year. Iowa had an opportunity, instead of going to the NIT, had an opportunity to go dancing. Many pundits saying at the time that if Iowa had won that game, that Iowa would have had a good case at being an NCAA tournament team. Instead, the officiating was absolutely hideous. There was a late call on Aaron White on um, a Michigan State jump shot that was uh, blocked by Aaron White stolen from Iowa, and they end up going to the NIT, reach the championship round where they had that crushing loss to Baylor. But that is my number three loss, third toughest loss since 2005, which brings me to number two. 
and I hate to bring it up again, but number two is absolutely this past Thursday. 67-63 loss versus Richmond. And um, look, I, I get there were no real expectations for this team to make the NCAA tournament heading into the year. But can we just be frank here? The the uh, the tables had turned. The expectations had changed. Um, I, I don't recall in my – I said this on Sunday. I don't recall in my Iowa basketball fandom being happier for a team than I was Sunday. And, and seeing a more impressive run and stretch than I did from Thursday to Sunday um, during that Big Ten tournament. I, I just – I can't even fathom – I really can't fathom how Iowa turned out the performance that they did on Thursday. I, I just have no explanation for it. Now, here's what's ironic. You're going to see my top two losses since 2005 were both NCAA tournament first-round games, and Iowa scored the same amount of points in both games. Kind of an ironic statistic. But again, Iowa's loss to the Spiders Thursday is my second toughest loss as an Iowa basketball fan to swallow since 2005. Number one, you're going to guess this. This is not hard. Number one, let's get it into focus, the 2006 NCAA tournament loss against Northwestern State in the first round. You will recall that Iowa was a three seed in that tournament. Northwestern State was a 14 seed. That was before the field eventually expanded further. The last second three, the hurl from the corner for what the demons or whatever they are. Adam Haluska, A Adam Haluska, Adam Haluska's three point um, hail mary there at the end falls short, and the Hawkeyes uh, once again. This is this is twice now. This has happened in 2006. Now 2022, you follow up a conference championship with a first round loss to a team that should have been overmatched. Now. This is by far, I shouldn't say by far, this is the bigger loss, in my opinion, because Northwestern State was not near the team that I think Richmond is. Richmond actually competes in a very, very good conference. I mean, I say very, very good. Again, that's relative. The Atlantic 10 is much better than the MEAC and the MAC and the, the you know, Colonial and all these conferences. I, I, I don't even know what conference is Northwestern State in. Does anybody know? I don't. I'm sure I can Google that. But that was the the biggest loss in the last 17 years, in my opinion. Now, there are some that, that deserve honorable mention, um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and show these to you as well. I figured I'd, I'd, I'd produce a, an honorable mention list here. Let's get this focused. 2020, the loss at Illinois, as you'll recall, that loss against Illinois kept Iowa from getting a double bye. Now, in the end, it didn't mean much because the tournament got canceled, um, but at the time, that loss felt big. It, it felt massive. Um, and you'll recall that uh, Luca Garza got blocked by Kofi Coburn on the final play of the game. But Iowa could have earned the double bye by winning in Champaign and lost. 2017, well, I'm shaking it all around. I apologize for that. 2017, the loss at Indiana. Um, you may recall a similar situation to that of 2013. Iowa wins that game. They're likely in the tournament. This came right after that miracle shot by Jordan Bohannon at Wisconsin. Iowa loses at Indiana, gets blown out. Excuse me. Not at Indiana. I don't know why it says at Indiana. Uh, uh, at a uh, neutral site. Neutral site game for the Hoosers and the Hawkeyes. And, of course, Iowa loses to Indiana. 2021, the loss versus Oregon. I think we can say that loss last year was a pretty significant gut punch to a team that had Final Four uh, aspirations at one time. Aspirations? Is that the right, uh, right terminology? And they lose, get blown out to the Ducks. 2019, the loss versus Tennessee. Iowa comes back from down like, what, 22, 21? Loses against the Volunteers in overtime after the miracle comeback. That was a gut punch. Would have went to the Sweet 16 had they won that game as well. 2014, the loss versus Tennessee. Patrick McCaffrey uh, with the cancer removal. Fran McCaffrey flies back out for the game. Another overtime loss to the Volunteers. And let's remember, that was the first time Iowa had been in the NCAA tournament since, what, 2006? Since For a long time. For a long, long time. So, um, tough. That, that, and that, by the way, that was the first four game that uh, that Tennessee game. But I, I, you know, before I before I actually wrote these these games down, I, I kind of forgot the fact that the Tennessee game 
uh, in 2019 and the Tennessee game in 2014 were both overtime losses. So Iowa has problem against, problems against Tennessee. Don't bring up the Tax Slayer Bowl in 2014, which ironically enough was the same year as that loss in the tournament. Um, Iowa has problems with the Volunteers for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. I know I didn't mention the Campbell Camels loss. I didn't mention the Nebraska Omaha loss. I mean, Licklider had some losses to like Louisiana Monroe and Duquesne. And I know Fran McCaffrey lost to South Dakota State, although that was the first game, I believe, of his tenure here at Iowa. Um, so I understand those were were somewhat embarrassing losses, but the toughest losses, that's what I wanted to run through this afternoon. I thought maybe some people would gain some enjoyment. Uh, Hayden, I'm sorry here. He says uh, this is a very hurtful, very hard stream to watch. Um you know, I, I, I'm sorry about that, Hayden. But uh, look, I, I, as I said in my tweet before I went live here, misery loves company. And this was a day we were supposed to have some pretty happy streams. This is a day where, um, again, we were going to get off the schneid and Iowa was going to be advancing to the first Sweet 16 that they've been able to uh, achieve since uh, since 1999. And it was for not because they didn't even win the first game against Richmond. So I wanted to jump on here for a while this, uh, on this Saturday and discuss this. Let me know what you think in the chat, and I can run through some of the comments here um, already. I did hear Doug. Um, he brings up that Northwestern 2014 loss. We are, we agree on the Tennessee loss, Doug. There's no question about it. Drill MVPs here um, still writhing over the loss to St. Peter's, as I, and I understand that. Uh, complete, that would be on my top 10 if I was a top five if I was a Kentucky fan. James, this was not just NCAA tournament. This is all losses, so... Certainly, uh, let me know what you think if you disagree. Uh, this is a good comment. Uh, wrestling, I don't know I'm doing much wrestling coverage, just have not had time. Uh, springtime 0502, shout out to Jacob Warner for continuing Iowa wrestling streak of sending a wrestler to the finals. And a disappointing year overall. I mean, I think we can all agree with that. Spencer Lee going down was uh, a gut punch there. Doug, yes, that uh, home against, uh, let's see, home against Indiana 2016 senior night for Big Ten title. At Iowa State the same year. So senior night for the Big Ten title. What are we talking about? Senior night for the Big Ten title. Well, that would have been, if it was, you're talking about the same year as the Iowa State loss, that was not senior night. That would have been the Big Ten tournament game, Doug. And that was first round or second round of the Big Ten tournament. So I explain, I'm, I'm a little bit confused at the message there. Um, Yes, the uh, the the, the uh, Big Ten tournament game. So I don't remember the senior night game, Doug. Um, I probably would if I if I looked it up, but I just don't remember it off the top of my head. But I'm sure I'm sure it was painful at the time. John says the um, okay. So he's he's going back further. And what is V I L L E? I'm sorry, I'm ignorant on that. But the Final Four lost um, in 1980. Uh, was that Villanova? I'd have to go back to my Iowa basketball history. Uh, yes, the UNLV loss, I'm very familiar with that Elite Eight loss in, in 87. The 2006 first round uh, loss, of course. 2000, or excuse me, number four Thursday. I can't think of a fifth. Yeah. So, uh, again, I know we only went back to 2005. I would have to get Gary close. That'd be an excellent topic for Gary and I to discuss sometime, although I don't know that I want to just continue to uh, swim in this subject because it is uh, somewhat difficult um drill mvp says some of us have a hard time beating a meac school yeah that that's uh i i understand i i understand the pain to a degree i mean again northwestern state does it can anybody tell me where northwestern state is from nobody nobody wanted to tell me that um whatever the case is uh ridiculous and yes uh we i think the northwestern state was the biggest loss i mean there's no the Thursday is close, though, folks. Thursday is close. I I, I don't know that you. I, how can you not think that Thursday is close? I mean, not saying it it rivals two thousand six, but it's certainly close. Both teams coming off a conference championship in the tournament. Uh, I know there were more expectations around two thousand six Iowa than this team heading into the year, but I think once you hit tournament time, they were equal nearly equal, maybe even more. I, I don't remember 2006, what tournament hype there was. I was pretty young at the time, although I remember the game vividly. But um, I, yeah, I'd have to say that the, there was probably just as much hype heading into this week 
as there was in 2006. Doug says maybe the SWAC. Yeah, may maybe. Possibly. M. Finn. Richmond has a bunch of super seniors. I was genuinely worried about that before tip-off. Northwestern State, on the other hand, we had no business losing to. And that's why I would rank them Northwestern State 1, Richmond 2. Maybe you can argue there's a gap there, but I, I think they're still pretty close. I just didn't expect that. I mean, I thought Richmond would be competitive. I didn't think Iowa was going to blow them out. And that's probably the difference. I think you could argue that Iowa should have blown out Northwestern State. Richmond, people want to diss Richmond. I still think Richmond deserves to be given credit because that is an experienced team. As you mentioned, um, Gilliard was, was fantastic. He's quick. He's tough to guard. Iowa still had no business losing. By the way, I did open the call line. If you want to give us a call, give me a call. 515-635-1601. Um, Hayden says, I was at that first four game. We lived in Columbus at the time. I hate Tennessee fans. Um, Let's take our first call here. Thank you for calling from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Who's on the line? Number five. Good question. Um, number five was the loss to Baylor NIT championship game 2013. Are you still there? Sorry about that. Yep, I can hear you just fine. Now, loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Okay, the three that I had that you didn't have was in 2014, we had that uh, Indiana game that got postponed because of the beam, and they were just rolling at that point. And then it right. had us, uh, we just lost out except for one game against Purdue, and then we just had a short schedule. I yes. had the TCU game at the end of 2017. Sure. Sure. Uh, yeah. And then um, the Penn State game in 2020 and uh, Palestra, where it was okay. a neutral site game, and they were doing really well in the beginning of the season. And I just wanted to throw those three in, and I'll hang up and uh, listen to the rest of the show. Thanks. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you. No, those are all good. And uh, the well, not good, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, the Penn State game, Palestra. I agree. That was a tough loss. I had a, a, a I remember that game vividly because um, a friend of mine and I were watching the game and uh, I, I, we had a friend that uh, ended up being admitted, uh, admitted to the hospital, ended up dying. So th that that game, I, it sticks out vividly. And I feel almost ashamed to, to equate my friend's death with sports. But, I, you know, I'm sure a lot of you on here agree. I remember things in life like time wise. A lot of it I equate to either music or sports. I know a lot of a lot of people have that sort of a memory. Um, I have a hard time remembering dates if it's not equated with something that is. I think part of it is because you have regular seasons and, and systematic uh, events, if you will. And same thing with music and re album releases and whatnot. Anyways, I digress. The, the Palestra game does stand out because of that very reason. And it was. It was a difficult game. I remember the floor being damp and wet because it was so hot in there and humid. And um, the good news about that game is Iowa did recover and finish the season pretty darn hot. I think they would have probably been a four or a five, if I recall, in the NCAA tournament that year. The TCU loss that our caller brought up, um, I do remember that game. I was at that game. Um, the only reason I didn't rank that in my top five was because it was not, um, I believe it was, uh, was it a second round game, first round game, first or second round game? Maybe it was quarterfinal, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, a semifinal or, or championship game in the NIT, but it was a tough loss. And I believe that was an OT loss as well. And then what's the other one he brought up? He brought up that senior day game. And I do remember the beam falling and the game being uh, postponed um, against Indiana. So I do remember that, um, but I'm just, I, I'm struggling to remember the makeup game. I, I remember the stretch where Iowa just collapsed. And that was sort of part of the Fran fade narrative that stuck. Um, was because of that collapse, and it was a, a pretty significant collapse. No, good good three there from our caller. Let's get our next caller here. Thank you for calling from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Who's on the line? Hey, uh, this is Doug from Ames, Iowa. Hey, Doug. You are mentioning one of my games there. The yes. The gamer Yogi Ferrell, like, went off on us. Adam Woodbury, uh, Anthony Clemens, uh, Gazelle, and Utah Senior Night. We were 12-5 uh, and five at the time, and... I think they were 13 and four. Uh, we finished 12 and six, but we lost. If we would have beat them, 
and beat Michigan, we would have tied for the title and we had the um, tiebreaker. I don't, I don't know if that makes it make more sense to you now. Man, I, I just don't remember. I mean, I, I kind of remember what you're saying. I may have been at that game as well. I remember being at an Indiana game where Iowa just played terribly. I just don't remember being. T- we, we would have been. missed the shot at the end. Say it again. Jock, Peter Jock missed the shot at the end to win the game. Okay, and, and Yogi Farrell did hit a late three that sealed it, correct? Yes. Okay, I do remember that vaguely, and I, I, I'm almost ashamed that I don't remember that, but um, clearly. But no, I, I do. I'm, I'm looking it up here. 2016, correct? Mm-hmm. It's the second to last game. Like I said it was senior night because I, I went to that game myself. Yeah, I, I, I think I was at that game, um, and I just, I just don't remember the implications. No, that would probably. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That should absolutely at least be on my, my honorable mention. Um, because I did, I for, totally forgot that there was a uh, title implications on the line there, um, and I remember that well, shot. Kind of. Yeah, well, I mean, some form of title implications there. So, and I remember that shot by Yogi Ferrell. Um, he was sensational, and and that was really. I don't remember. The, let me look up the score of that game. You remember the score, Doug? Oh, it's Tom Wick. Uh, uh, it's a one or two point game. I'm just curious. I'm just as far the reason I bring up the score. Let me just see if I can find it here. Um, let's see, two thousand seventy-seven, seventy-five. What's yeah, the score? Farrell had twenty points, eighty-one seventy-eight. We were ranked sixteenth in the country. They were ranked twelfth. I see it. I see it. I'm looking at the wrong March score. Eighty-one seventy-eight. Yep, you got it. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I remember. I, I I think I was at that game and. Um, those were two really good teams for the record. I mean, both those, that Indiana team, mm-hmm. that Indiana team was legit. And, um, but the Iowa, that Iowa team was legit. That was a good Iowa team. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed that group. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, uh, I mean, some of, some of Fran's best players he's had here, uh, kind of culminated in that yeah. season. Well, and the other thing about that year was, uh, first and second round games were in Des Moines. And we started following them because they were leading the Big Ten at one point. And we thought they would get placed in Des Moines for uh, first and second round games in the NCAA tournament, but that was part of that fan fade, uh, fade. And they ended up, I think, being a seventh seed that year and beat Temple. Right. And, and then lost uh, to Villanova. Yep. Yeah. I just remember that being a really rough year because they were ranked third in the country. Third in the country. And then, yeah. and then we uh, lost all those games. And it was just like, uh, cause I, we we got tickets to go down to the tournament in Des Moines thinking that midway through the season that they would go. Also, that was the same year that, uh, I won, went 12 and 0 in the, uh, regular season of football. So at one point we had 16 straight wins in the big 10 regular season between basketball and football. Yeah. And then I remember, uh, cause we've had these discussions like the best, the best, uh, years for both men's basketball and football at the same time. That's certainly at the top of the list because you're right. 12 and 0 Virgin college football playoff, Iowa basketball, three in the country. That was also the year. If I recall, Doug, where Iowa went to East Lansing and blew the doors off the Spartans. Correct. Yes. They beat them both times that year. Right. They upset uh, them. They're they number, number one. They upset the them. Number one in Carver. Uh, I was at that game as well. Rushed the court. Tom Izzo's, I believe Tom Izzo's dad died before that game, correct? I don't remember that, but I remember us beating yeah. them when they were ranked number one. Starting to come back and to me. I, I do remember that. that. That that season is one of the more memorable seasons for me because, yeah, I, I was bought into that team. And that team played pretty good defense. I mean, it wasn't great, but it yeah. was pretty good defense. Yeah, Anthony Clements, was a, he could lock down anyone. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you for taking my call, and hopefully I jogged your memory a little bit. No, there, you did. Like, I, I no, appreciate you. This game. <laughs> I, I forgot the implications behind the Indiana game, but no, I appreciate it, Doug. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Take care. No, those are all those are all good. And that season in general, if you're if you're gonna ask me to rank, I mean, certainly like that is where that friend fade narrative. I mean, I know that, that I have to go back, and and there were a, probably another season where they lost like the last three of four and then lost in the big 10 tournament lost and maybe the marble year. I think that was a, a fade year. I don't remember how many they lost at the end of that year, but the, the, the first four lost to Tennessee 
was part of that Fran fate, if you if you want to call it that. But um, yeah, the 2016 uh, Utah Woodbury Gasell, Clemens, those guys were seniors. That was that was such a, a disappointing end of the season. I, I just he Doug brought it up, number three in the country, and and I think the reason I didn't think of the Indiana game is because it was it was a series of games. Uh, of just fading, and that is the the right word to use. It was just a fade, and and then losing the the Big Ten tournament. I believe that was the I think Doug mentioned that the loss to Penn State was just inexplicable. I, I think I'm not. I hope I'm not getting that confused. I'm pretty certain I'm I've got that right. It was a loss to Penn State, and uh, yeah, no, all all valid points. Um, the real Hayden says Oregon game last year. I don't think we prepared for that blowout. I don't think we were equipped to play that Oregon team, Hayden. I don't think uh, athletically Iowa could match up. And I think the Oregon sort of exposed, and I think possibly that loss did Iowa good this year. And now we're looking back at a, a first round exit, but from a defensive standpoint, I I'd have to think that if there was any doubt of what Iowa needed to do and the philosophy change defensively, if there was any doubt that that change needed to occur, that game had to convince whether it be Jordan Bohannon or the coaching staff, both, and everybody else in that roster that look, we, we can't just win with a bunch of three point shooters that can't play defense. And I love Luca Garza and Joe Wieskamp and CJ Frederick. None of those guys were great defenders. I always heard that CJ Frederick was, was the team's best defender. I never saw that. Uh, and yeah, Iowa got routed, absolutely routed in that game. Ryan, as long as Iowa remains a st- statistical extreme top 25 in offensive efficiency outside the top 50 in defensive efficiency, we should expect more first weekend losses. I, I I agreed with that to a point, Ryan. I will say this, though. The final couple months of the season, Iowa was, I believe, top 30 defensively or close to it. So, you know, I know Ken Palm, and probably you're, you're, you're looking at Ken Pomeroy's adjusted defensive efficiency ratings. Um, when you get that late in the season, it's hard to really bring up your average, even if you're playing good basketball on that end. And Iowa did not lose Thursday because of defense. Can we make that clear? I mean, I know they they struggled at times to get stops in that second half. Scored 63 points. I mean, Iowa scored the second best offense in the country, and Iowa scored 63 points. So it was such a it was a confounding loss because this was in by no means anything close to how Iowa lost to Oregon last year. It was just not that at all. Both were disappointing. Definitely Southland. Okay, Northwestern State is the Southland Conference again. Um, doesn't uh, doesn't make me feel any better. But uh, appreciate you uh, all three of you uh, clearing that up. Um, Ryan says the Big Ten Tourney Championship feels pretty hollow after the first round loss, and that's the unfortunate thing to a lot of fans. And I'm not saying you're wrong, Ryan, but to a lot of fans. Um, that Big Ten championship loss, or excuse me, that Big Ten championship is almost like it didn't happen. I mean, that's we're less than a week removed from that championship, from those guys hoisting the trophy and the confetti and Joe Toussaint crying, talking to his grandmother on the phone, and you know, the McCaffreys embracing each other. And I just feel so freaking terrible for those guys because look, I they lost fair and square. That's what stinks. But that Big Ten championship game, that Big Ten championship, what they did last week should not be downplayed and I understand where you're coming from Ryan I it's hard for me to take joy in that as well very very hard and perhaps that because it's because we place way too much emphasis on the Big Ten tournament or excuse me on on the NCAA tournament and not enough on the Big Ten tournament and I think that the argument can be made I brought this up yesterday on the show and it was brought up by some of our listeners perhaps you look at moving the Big Ten tournament up more I can understand that that um that mindset but um I just feel so bad for Fran McCaffrey. And I, I had an exchange with someone, was it yesterday? And and look, I, I love commenting back. I love interacting with folks on the live streams, on our chat, on videos. I try to read as many comments as possible and get back to people. Uh, I don't always keep up. It doesn't mean it's anything personal. But I did, someone did um, respond. And one of our regular listeners, I won't say his name, uh, but I appreciate him commenting. But um, he made the comment that basically, you know, what confidence do I have in Fran McCaffrey getting over the hump that is the NCAA tournament and getting to the Sweet 16? Why do I have any confidence that will happen? 
We've we've seen 12 years of not being able to get over the hump. What makes you think it's going to happen next year? I, I don't know if it's going to happen next year, but if you're asking me why I have confidence that things can change, I look at what happened to the Big Ten tournament. Anybody who's listened to my show, my podcast for years, I know I just we just launched the launched the YouTube channel last year, but even my podcast from years prior, I have been on Fran McCaffrey for not winning in the Big Ten tournament. It's been a huge source of frustration for me, even in Iowa's best years, failing to win in the tournament. I've actually been less critical of the NCAA tournament because typically they've lost to just teams with a lot more firepower, Villanova, Gonzaga, um, you know, even the Tennessee loss. They Iowa was the lower seed. Tennessee was a two seed. That, that's an understandable loss. But the Big Ten losses have been absolutely maddening because we're talking losses to Northwestern, losses to Penn State. Um, did they lose to Illinois at some point? I don't think they did. Uh, but losses they just simply should not ever have. And never being able to win more than one game in the Big Ten tournament, to me, feels even more ridiculous than never being able to win two games in March Madness because we're talking about a conference. We're not talking about the, the best of the best in the country. We're talking about you know winning against a you know 10 to 14 seed or 11 to 14 seed in the first round and then potentially um you know i, I know you you have a double buy or you have a single buy or even no buy and that changes things but he had never won two games in that big 10 tournament so circling back around to my response to this gentleman the reason i have confidence that things can change with fran mccaffrey and that he will get over the hump and i'm not guaranteeing it but you're asking me why i have some level of confidence the reason is because he did it this year in the big 10 tournament you could say well it's different Okay, it's different. Fine. But I, I was critical of him before this year about the Big Ten tournament. He came into the Big Ten tournament this year, and they won four games in four days. So he doesn't deserve to be fired. He doesn't deserve to be let go. I, I just, you know, who's to say Fran McCaffrey and this team doesn't regroup and say, look, we got over the Big Ten tournament hump this year, and next year they get over the, the March Madness hump, and they're in the Elite Eight or the, at least in the Sweet 16. I, I think that's feasible. And personally, everybody has a right to their own opinion, but personally, I do take I do take confidence away from what we saw last week, even though it's hard to really think about that performance in those four games, given what we just saw two days ago. Um, I am I am happy with the progress that we saw this year. I'm happy with the steps that, that, that this program took this year in winning a Big Ten championship. To me, that's massive. People want to downplay it. To me, I believe it's massive. And um, obviously, Fran's job is not on the line. I just want to make that clear. Um, M. Finn, baby steps, Corey. Yes, baby steps. Progress will never be as rapid as we all want, but the program is miles ahead of where it was when Fran took over. And I hear, here's the deal, M. Finn. I hear people, I've heard a lot of people these last few days, and I get the people are upset. But I've heard a lot of people these last few days implying that Fran needs to be fired. And, and I'm so, I'm baffled by that. How, how can we say that? How can we say that Fran needs to be fired? We saw what happened to the program when Tom Davis was let go because he wasn't winning enough in March Madness. We went to Alford. He didn't do anything in March Madness. Then we went to Licklider, and all of a sudden, you're bottom of the barrel in the Big Ten Conference. And Fran has built this thing back up. We just won, Iowa just won the, the Big Ten Tournament for the first time since 2006. The recruit, to me, development and recruiting are at an all-time high. Now, you can say... How could it be at an all-time high? The, the Murray brothers were like, what, two-star recruits? Um, you know, Perkins was not... Perkins has been... Tony Perkins, in one year of play, well, now two years of play, is one of the better guards in the conference. I'm not saying he's I'm not saying he's top five, top six. He is a really good starting guard in the Big Ten. Keegan Murray, I know he. it took a year to get here, but he is a five-star guy now. Okay, Chris Murray is a four-star guy now and will be a five-star guy, I, I would guess, next, next season. So I do believe recruiting, identifying talent, and developing these guys is at an all-time high. Defensively, Iowa took a big step this year. Again, we talked about the Big Ten Championship. There are, very, there are a number of reasons to be encouraged with Iowa basketball despite what happened on Thursday. That, that's, that's what I will say. If you want to disagree, you have every right to, but I think it's ridiculous that people are implying that Fran's job may be on the line just because of what we saw this year. And you'll say, well, it's not just because of this year. It's because of every year. I get that. Ryan says, I think fans are upset due to 20 plus years of NCAA tourney futility. Not all 
Fran's fault. It's the Tom Davis curse. And you may very well be right, Ryan. Um, but it is hard to, uh, it is hard to blame Fran for what Alford failed to do, what Licklider failed to do when Fran is doing a lot of good and doing a lot better than I, I think he's passed. I think we can agree. Fran has surpassed what Alford was able to do here. Okay. Now that he's won the big 10 tournament, you can, we, I think it's safe to say he has surpassed the success of Steve Alford here. Uh, Hayden says, uh, Teams fire coaches all the time for not winning in March. March winning in March is the reason everyone plays the sport. If winning in March is not the goal, what are we doing here? Same with football. So who are we going to hire, Hayden? My, that's my question. Who are you going to hire? We're just going to keep fi- hiring and firing every three years. I, I just want to know because yeah, it's, you want to win in March, great. So we place so much emphasis on the Big Ten tournament. We don't care. Why do we even or on the NCAA tournament? Why do we even play the regular season? Why is the Big Ten tournament something that? Wh- why do we even play it? What's the point? If if everything, it just comes down to one tournament and there's no round robin setup and you lose in one game and you're done, why do we even play the rest of the season? I, I just want to know, what's the point of playing the rest of the season? So we're just, ju- yeah, because if you're just judging Fran on winning in March, I guess he should be fired. But Tom Davis should have been fired. Steve Alford should have been fired. Licklatter should have been fired. None of those guys succeeded here. So we're just going to continue the circle until someone strikes gold and wins in the tournament. And no, it's not a cop out, Hayden. It's not a cop out at all. I, I just want to know who you're going to hire because everybody wants to let go of Fran, who you're going to hire, because obviously it doesn't matter to a lot of people that Fran just won the big 10 tournament. And, and I don't know about you, Hayden, but it matters to me as a fan that Fran just won the big 10 tournament. And there's a lot of coaches out there. In fact, 13 other coaches in the big 10 conference this year that failed to do that. Okay. Purdue hasn't won a Big Ten championship, I think, since 2009. Purdue. Matt Painter, one of the, considered one of the better coaches, not only in the Big Ten, but in the country. So, I, I, you know I respect your opinion, Hayden. I, I don't agree with you whatsoever on this. Um, because, to me, I, I just don't know what, what we expect here. It's not only 16 teams can make it to the Sweet 16. So... I get it. Fran needs to get there at some point. I know it doesn't have to be every year. At some point, he needs to get there. But when you're seeing steps forward being taken, and I don't think anybody can deny that there aren't steps forward being taken right now, given the fact that defensively they improved substantially throughout the year and they they got over the hump in the Big Ten tournament, how can we argue there aren't being steps taken? Are we just willing to throw that away and say, well, let's, let's go to somebody who can do it faster? Because I don't think that person's out there. I, I just don't think that person is out there. Ryan says, uh, is there even a slight chance Keegan comes back? My guess is yes, there's a slight chance. And I think it helped as, as morbid as it sounds. I think it helped that the fact that Iowa lost the way they did and, and lost in the first round. I know people were reading into to Keegan's comments after the game when he said, we just got to get back to work and focus on next season. My guess is that might, might have been, uh, that might have been a rehearsed, um, rehearsed wording phrasing that I'm not telling you Fran said that or told him to say that or Kenyon told him to say that, but that may have been well thought out that way to kind of downplay any questions about, are you leaving? My guess is that he hasn't made that decision yet. Now, maybe he has, maybe he has, and he's coming back. Maybe he has, and he's leaving, but I would still, I would still lean towards heavily towards him leaving. Um, but I, I think there's a slightly bigger chance now that given what I, what happened on Thursday, that he would come back. If he comes back, if he comes back, if I'm Iowa or an Iowa fan, sky's the limit next year. And Hayden, you, then I think there is, if, if he can't get to the sweet 16 next year, if Keegan comes back and Chris is back and Tony Perkins is back, even though you lose Bohannon, if, if Connor comes back, I mean, no, they need to they need to get to the Sweet 16 next year. But I still don't know if they don't get it there next year. And I, I don't know that I'm saying fire Fran. And I know you're saying, you know, you never said I, I know you never said he should be fired, but I just don't know that this isn't firing someone out of fear, though. That's the problem, Hayden. I'm telling you, the reason he should not be fired, in my opinion, is because he is taking steps forward. It's not because I'm fearful of what could come. I am realistic about what could happen. But I'm not fear. You of all people, Hayden, should know. You follow my stuff enough to know I am not. I, I don't. My opinions are not, are not based upon fear. 
All right. I've been saying for a long time that Iowa quarterbacks need the Iowa football team needs to go to the portal and get a quarterback. And I hear all the time, all the time fans. I had somebody this morning on Twitter. Well, the grass isn't always greener. I've had people say privately, you know, you're hitting that, you're hitting that a little bit too hard. You know, what if a quarterback comes in here and is a disaster and, and is, you know, causes chemistry problems and locker room problems that is operating out of fear. And I feel like Iowa football does that at times. Something I respect about Fran is I don't I don't believe Fran operates out of fear. And, and I'm just telling you right now, the reason why I don't think Fran is even remotely in jeopardy, it has nothing to do with fear of what could come. It's I am pleased with the progress I'm seeing. I'm pleased with the Big Ten Championship this year. I'm pleased with recruiting, development, evaluating that he's doing. I'm pleased with who he is as a person. And that's why I'm supportive of Fran moving forward. But I have been critical of Fran. The people that say I've never been critical of Fran, that's just bogus. I'm not going to go back and take the time to prove it to you. You can go back and listen to my content. I've been very critical of Fran at times, but I do not believe he's even close to being on the hot seat. Tom says, I'm not a Fran fan, but I'm not asking for him fired. Yeah, and you don't have to be a Fran fan, I guess. I mean, I'm a Fran fan, um, but... Um, no, there's just no way. I think you're being realistic, Tom, as I am. M. Finn says no one can do it faster and not end up on probation in five years. We are not Kansas. We are not Michigan State. Very true. Now, he has been here 12 years. For the the other side of this, M. Finn, people will say, well, he's been here 12 years. I get that. I get that. And it's getting to a point where he needs to do it. He needs to get there preferably next year. Because if he not doesn't do it next year, then, you know. But I just don't think there's any way – Iowa football hasn't won a Big Ten championship since 2004. I mean, what are we, you know, what are we doing? And that was a shared title, shared title in 2002. Haven't won a Big Ten outright since what 85. Is is Kirk Ferentz in jeopardy? Not at all. We all know that, whether you think he should be or not. So that's just how it works. Um, springtime 0502 basketball and football very similar this year came into the season with low to mid expectations overachieved i think fans think the end of the season expectations were all year yeah i mean that's a good that's a good estimation springtime if if you had told fans at the beginning of these of, of this season specifically basketball if you had told fans um that iowa would advance to the NCAA tournament and lose i think a lot of fans would take that because a lot of fans did not expect iowa i know a lot of people in the iowa media who are negative about everything. Now, and, and I'm not saying a lot of Iowa media people are, but there are certain people in the Iowa media who can say nothing good about anything that Iowa does. Everything is gloom and doom. And, and so people call me a cynic. Listen to some of these people who are covering Iowa sports. And some of them are great, but some of them I think have maybe overstayed their welcome. I'm not going to say who I, I think that is. But my point is you probably know who I'm referring to if there's a, a person or two that uh, you feel the same way about. Um, but I've heard couple people in the media from six months ago predicting that Iowa would have a hard time getting the NIT and then throughout the year downplaying everything good Iowa did you know I heard the same individual that I'm referring to and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say who it is heard the same individual state that Michigan State was a terrible team when Iowa beat them that's a terrible Michigan State team Michigan State is in the second round of the NCAA tournament but see this is the you have all these mixed narratives the media the, the media really drives a lot of that but you're absolutely right, Springtime. If you had told fans at the beginning of the year, you're going to be in the NCAA tournament, regardless of if you win or not, fans would have taken that. But because, because the narrative and because the expectations had shifted and the needle had been moved because of Fran and because of this team, the needle moved because they won, what, 10 of their last 12 games? That's why the needle was moved. And so the needle gets moved, and now people expect more. And believe you me, folks, when Fran gets to the Sweet 16, the needle's going to move again. And he's going to say, well, we haven't been to the Elite Eight since how long? Or we haven't been to the Final Four since how long? You get to the Final Four, people are going to, there are going to be a segment of the fan base that says, well, when's the last time we won a national title? If we, if we can get to the Final Four, why can't we win a national title? You may think that's silly, but the needle moves. Okay? And that will be what happens. At some point, that will happen once Fran gets there. I just, I, I hate it. That's why I don't buy into it whatsoever. And Hayden, you're right. Uh, there is way too big of a buyout. He's not going anywhere. And Ryan brings up Gary Barta holding co uh, coaches accountable. Curious what those conversations would be like with both Fran and Kirk. For the record, I think Kirk has more power than Gary Barta in the athletic department. 
Um, but Fran was hired by Gary Barta. So I think Gary Barta has held Fran a lot more accountable at times than Kirk. That's just my opinion. Um, he's been hard on Fran at times uh, after. And, and I'm not saying that Fran didn't deserve to be suspended when he had a couple meltdowns. I think he's been suspended twice. But um, Kirk has more power than Gary Barta in that, that athletic department. That's my opinion. Um, but uh, again, even Gary would, I think, tell you Fran does not, I mean, we, we got to be celebrating the banner and it is, they deserve to have a banner. In my opinion, Doug says, uh, someone just put a, a video clip of YouTube of, uh, the Steve Alford hiring. Everyone believed that Steve Alford was the great white hope. Steve was uh, supposed to be twice the coach of Kirk. Kirk was the bad hire. Um, real Hayden says, Wichita state VCU Dayton are programs. We should be better than they've been light years ahead of Iowa over the last decade. That's just simply not true. Hayden. They've been light years ahead of Iowa in the NCAA tournament. So, again, you you and I just have different priorities, I guess. I am not basing everything. I'm not basing my opinion on a program solely on the NCAA tournament. Okay? Dayton didn't even make the tournament this year, and you're just including them in this list. Iowa's to a point now where they're basically making the tournament every year. That's basically what they're doing now. So I, I get it. You, you and I just have different priorities and every fan has a right to have their own priorities. Um, but I, I just don't, I, I just don't believe that. Um, I just don't believe that Wichita state VCU and Dayton, you can consider are, are better programs than Iowa. Those, those teams aren't even in power five conferences. Um, so it's a different, it's a different playing field. It's a different playing field. Springtime says, however, wrestling went opposite. High expectations have underachieved. Injuries have not helped. Um, Doug says, Kirk and uh, Fran are here as long as Barta is here. Probably, Doug. Um, Fran, you know, if he, Fran ever decides to leave, um, he'll leave. Fran, uh, Kirk's not going anywhere, obviously. Um, you know, I'd like to think that Fran's not going, you know, that he's not going to leave. Uh, I, I will be very upset if Fran leaves. A lot of fans will be celebrating that. I think that's a really bad thing for the program if, if Fran were to leave. And I don't think he will be. Um, but uh, that would not be something that I would take joy in. Tom, Fran has to, has too many, uh, what is, I'm, I'm confused at this message, Tom, to ever get to the final four. PR has too many PR ever. So explain, please, Tom. Um, the real Hayden. I still ain't buying the who you're gonna hire after 12 years. You still don't care what happens in March. All have been further in the NCAA tournament multiple times. So again, Hayden, you base everything on the Final Four. You base everything on the NCAA tournament and success in the tournament. And you say it's it's that that's what it all comes down to. I think it's a major part of what it comes down to. But I also think the Big Ten championship is a major thing. I'm talking the regular season. I think the Big Ten tournament is a major thing. Okay. And I, that's why I think Fran needs to be applauded and lauded. He should have been coach of the year in the big 10 Hayden, in my opinion, you may have a different opinion. I think Kurt Fran McCaffrey very well could have been the big 10 coach of the year. Had Greg guard not been here, he would have been the big 10 coach of the year. There were no expectations with this team. They had lost Luca Garza, CJ Frederick, Jack Nungy, Joe Wieskamp. Okay. And made the tournament as a five seed. They had one, Bad game, folks. One in the tournament. And don't bring up November because you just got done saying, or you know, or December, you just got done saying that it all comes down to the tournament. They had one bad game. Okay. It's win or go home. Kentucky lost to St. Peter's. Colorado State lost to an 11 seed. Uh, Connecticut lost to a 12 seed. Baylor just got upset by an unranked North Carolina team. It's what happens. So I understand where you're coming from. It's been 12 years. I get that. And I'm telling you, it needs to happen. But I'm not going to say the guy who I just said a week ago needed to be the Big Ten pl uh, coach of the year needs to be fired or should even be mentioned in hot seat conversations. Love you as always, Hayden. But you and I have a different opinion here. And I know you've never said matter of fact that he needs to be fired. I just don't think the, the, the conversation is appropriate at this point. Tom says that Fran is not a good enough coach to make the Final Four. I mean, that's up That's up to, for debate. Um you know, we'll see. He's been here 12 years. I get that. Um, he's had some pretty darn good teams. I, I thought, uh, I honestly, if you combine last year's team with last year's three point shooting, you know, with this team and, and the athletes, and I know that there were some, some carryovers from last, from last year,
But I really do think had Jack Nungy stuck around, maybe Wieskamp or Frederick, one of those two guys, not to mention Garza, you know, maybe you're looking at a team that, that had the capabilities of, of getting to the final four. But Tom, you got to remember, there were a lot of pundits here three days ago. Clark Kellogg, Dick Vitale, Andy Katz, all these guys were predicting Iowa in the final four. So, and I know it didn't happen. And so you have every, every right to your opinion, but I, I would never, I would, I would never say never on something like this. Um, M. Finn said there was a time not long ago that we would have all been thrilled that Iowa made the tournament every year. I'm with you. Tipsy says if Fran ever leads, I might go with him. Um, Chase, good to see her. Chase, he says coming in late. I think this loss is the most disappointing in recent memory. Last year's team was good, but also in the same region as Gonzaga, and we're over uh, outmatched by them. Um. Yeah, I mean, look, the Oregon loss, I mean, that team was exposed. That team never really turned the corner defensively as much as maybe some of the media and the narrative shifted and and people wanted to believe that the that this Iowa team or that Iowa team had um, turned the corner defensively. They never really did. I, I felt much differently about this team this year, winning 10 of their last 12, winning the Big Ten tournament and doing so defensively. I thought they played their best game of the season against Purdue. So yeah, to follow it up with a, with a loss against Richmond, you could argue it's just as as bad as the the Northwestern loss in 2006. I still think that one was a bit more, um, I don't know, tougher to just tougher to swallow given the opponent in 2006. Richmond's a respectable program, shouldn't have beaten Iowa, but respectable. Northwestern State is, I mean, I don't think there's any history there, um, but uh, I understand where you're coming from. It would have been a tough route for Iowa, tough tough region last year, really favorable draw this year for the Hawks and we'll never know what could have happened. Real Hayden says they always have their, their worst game first weekend in March. Okay, sure. I mean, I, I get it. I'm frustrated as well. And Finn says Kansas only leads Creighton by one at halftime. If Creighton wins that game, if Creighton wins that game, I think I may just uh, crawl into a hole. Um, but I just, I don't know. Um, Doug says, uh, only one current big 10 coach, um, has ever coached in the final four. Come on people. Last time Purdue was in the final four with us was 1980. Thank you. Perspective is needed here, folks. Perspective is needed. Chase, this year's team had, I think some of the best talent in the region watching Kansas. They look totally beatable. I get it. I get it. Tom says, uh, the, uh, pundits were crazy. We weren't going to the final four like Kirk. We will, uh, like Kirk will have a Big Ten quarterback MVP. John, uh, that one bad game happens routinely. We can agree to disagree. What happens in the tourney is all that matters. Yeah, we are going to have to agree to disagree on that, John, because for, for me to say it's all that matters, then again, why do we play the rest? What's the point? It's just all to build the resume for one one tournament game where you lose one, you have one bad performance. I mean, I understand this mindset. I, I love college basketball, but I love a lot about college basketball. I love the early season tournaments. I love the the rivalries. I love, um, you know, the the neutral site games. I love going up to the Palester, or to the Palester, or to um, the Pentagon in 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 whatever that is, um, <laughs> South Dakota. Um, so yeah, we can agree to disagree, John. I respect your opinion, but uh, I love a lot more in the Big Ten. I love always love the Big Ten tournament, and I don't. I don't want to look at college basketball with a mindset of the tournament is all that matters because if I do that, I'm going to lose joy in everything else I, I watch. And I've had a lot of joy over the years watching Fran McCaffrey's teams. I've also had a lot of frustration, but um, I have had joy and that's just how I see it. The real Hayden, for the record for everyone in the chat, I've probably been to more games than most. I'm still supporting the basketball teams. Can't say that for the football team. Fair enough. Let's see. That's your prerogative. Uh, Doug Moore says, um, Miller Olson raveling all leftists for the Pac-10. Believe it or not, we don't. We uh, believe it or not, we don't want to go back to being a stepping stone. Millennials need to learn some history. Doug, I'm a millennial. Okay, Doug, I am not. I'm not past thirty. I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, but uh, maybe I've said that on the show before. I'm in my twenties, Doug, and I I agree with you on this, sir. So it's not all just young people. I I, I everybody has a right to their own opinion. I just see things differently. Um. I can tell we're, we're not going to agree on this. I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate the back and forth, folks. Um, 
we can all unite in the fact that Iowa needs to, I think we can all agree with this. Um, Iowa needs to get to the Sweet 16 soon. And I, I, I wasn't really saying that heading into this year. I, I'm saying it now. I'm saying it now. It needs to happen. The Big Ten tournament needed to change and shift, and, and the narrative with Iowa basketball needed to change as it related to that tournament, and it did. Iowa wins that tournament. That's a huge accomplishment. Now the next step is winning in March, specifically not in the Big Ten tournament, but in March Madness, in the NCAA tournament. It does matter. I'm acknowledging that. John, I'm not saying you can't enjoy games during the regular season. What would you say is the reasonable expectations for the program? Reasonable expectations for the program? Um, I think finishing in the top five of the conference, um, on a semi-regular basis, which is what Fran has done for the record. I mean, he's finished in the top half of the conference, I think like every year, but one, um, since he got here now, I guess maybe every year, but two, he had the year, year one, uh, he did not finish top half. I don't believe. And then the year, um, Bohannon's sophomore year, they, they wouldn't have finished that high. Um, I they got to get to the Sweet 16. And I would say Sweet 16 every four to five years. Maybe people think that should be more, there should be um, greater expectations than that. I'm not going to go higher than every four to five years because they haven't been there since 99. So it needs to happen. We're, we're in agreement with that. It needs to, they need to get to the Sweet 16, John. Um, I'm behind him. I, I'm supportive of Fran McCaffrey. I know Hayden, you're supportive of Fran. You've never said he should be fired. I'm fine with the back and forth, um, but as Chase brings out, we're hanging a batter, banner this year. Um, I, I think, you know, the Keegan Murray decision is going to be important. I'm not going to dismiss him coming back. I, I don't think that's a done deal. I think likely he is gone, and that will be sad, but it will be understandable. I still think him leaving and going to the NBA and having success could help recruiting immensely. Um, but regardless, they are hanging a banner, and uh, next year the step has to be get to the sweet 16. I think that's, that's, uh, that's legitimate. And there'll be some pressure. There will be pressure on Fran McCaffrey next year, a lot more than this. Um, Doug comments on uh, Miller and Schultz. When Miller left, we got Schultz after Davis, we got lick lighter. Um, we would still be yo-yoing around. I would prefer consistency. Chase says, uh, what programs actually do get to the sweet 16 consistently? It's tough, man. It's, it's tough. Upsets happen. Look at Kentucky. I keep bringing them up. Look at Virginia a few years ago as a one seed losing to a 16 seed. Now, the year after, they won the tournament. Okay? Virginia didn't even make the tournament this year, folks. They won the tournament the year after they lost as a one seed. Let's just remember that. Thomas. Maybe Thomas missed the first part of the show. Is Fran McCaffrey on the hot seat next season? No. Fran McCaffrey's got a pretty long leash right now, folks. Whether we want to acknowledge, whether you think that should be the case or not, he's got a pretty long leash right now. Winning the Big Ten tournament, doing what he did this year despite the losses from last year, and I'm talking about personnel losses, Fran McCaffrey's got a fairly long leash at this point. And Finn says, the sad reality is that to be a national recruiting entity, we need success in March. I will eagerly watch every game from November to February, but as a high school but a high school kid making his decision cares about March. Um, can we both agree on this though? And and I this would be an interesting conversation with people who know more about it, more about recruiting than I do. I would actually think, M. Finn, and you're right, March is important. But I would actually think that success as as it relates to developing NBA talent may even be uh, more consequential than success in March because March success is hard to sustain. And that's why I do believe if Keegan Murray ends up coming back, which I think there's a slight chance that occurs, slight chance, if that were to occur, it would be great. But if he leaves, that actually could help recruiting in the, in the long run. He's going to go there. He's going to go to the NBA eventually. I'd love to have him come back. But um, he being in the NBA and possibly being a household name in the league, I think would boost recruiting. Derek. I would much rather be a team that consistently loses during the first weekend of the NCAA tournament than a team that only makes the tournament once every four or five years. I agree with that. But with that being said, I also acknowledge got to get to the, the second weekend at some point. You know, every four to five years um, at the minimum. I, I think that's that's fair, right? Every four to five years making the Sweet 16 at the minimum, and hopefully one of those years you can make a run to an Elite Eight or Final Four. 
Um, I think that's I think that's fair. Uh, Bowen Dix and uh, Owen Freeman are all good recruits. Uh, recruiting is going well. He thinks they'll all play right away. We'll see with Dix's health. I'm concerned about his uh, his health moving forward. They they could really use him next year. I wouldn't be surprised to see the Iowa go to the portal at some point. Of course, Freeman's not going to be here till 23 unless he reclassifies, and I have no reason to think that will happen. Thomas says, uh, who's Iowa starting quarterback next season for football? Um, good question. Um, Thomas, I think it's probably Spencer Petrus, folks. I, I think it probably is. I, I think I've made that clear in the past. Um, I'm not saying that's what I want. That's You're asking me who uh, who I think will be Iowa's starting quarterback. I think it'll be Spencer Petrus. By the way, I did tweet this out yesterday. If you follow me on Twitter, Florida quarterback Emory Jones is in the portal. And um, if I'm Iowa, I'm taking a look. I'm taking a good, hard, long look at at, at uh, Emory Jones. Florida, of course, uh, overhauling its coaching staff. Um, Emory Jones had a decent season last year. His numbers overall, they're not even in the same conversation of what anything Iowa has done these past two seasons at quarterback. Um, he is a dynamic rusher. Um, in fact, let me let me pull his numbers up before we end the show. Um. Yes, thank you for this, Chase. Emory Jones should be Iowa's next quarterback. Um, okay, we'll finish the Fran, then I'll go to fr- finish the Fran comment here, and then we'll go to uh, Emory Jones to finish this show out. Uh, he says, I'll leave by saying Fran has been here 12 years. We don't have expectations after 12 years. We're just not going anywhere, spinning the tires in the mud. In the mud. Again, we agree on this, Hayden. He needs to get there next year. That needs to happen. Because, yeah, it hasn't happened yet, and it, it is sort of ridiculous that it hasn't happened. But, um, I'm giving him some more time. Um, go ahead and pull up Emory Jones stats here. Perhaps. Um, maybe I'll be able to pull this off. I'm kind of doing this on the fly. I did not have this prepared. If I can get this and then we can all look at it together and get your thoughts on, uh, on Emory Jones. Um, and again, he is a, a, a he'll be a fifth year guy. He has two years of eligibility remaining, primarily because um, he played four years his or four games his freshman year and played um, he played during the COVID year. So he'll get an extra year as a result of that. So technically, he could be in college for two years. Um. I, I don't know why, you, if you're Iowa, you wouldn't look at someone like this. He's mobile. Um, he, he could potentially be a, a, a game changer. Yes, John, he is very, very mobile. Let me go ahead and pull up his numbers, folks. And people can laugh at that. I don't know why. I, I, don't, I really don't understand why people think it's funny that I keep talking about the portal. I get I've been on it forever, but... I just I don't understand how we're how I was not considering going to the portal. I just uh, I just don't get it. Um, okay, here we go. Passing and rushing. Okay, here are Emory Jones' numbers. And again, apologize for the slight delay. There, we'll start with passing. So everybody can see his statistics throughout his career. This is Emory Jones. So you see his freshman year. Um, he goes, uh, um, just played in four games, right? Um, pretty high QBR for the 12 completions he had for the year. But uh, again, I ignore the 18 year. 19, he plays in 11 games. Um Actually, only threw the ball eight, uh, 38 times, ironically enough. And I, I, I'd i have to look back at Florida's. I really don't know what he did in those first three years because I know we played in some of these games, but I really just don't know uh, enough about Emory Jones from prior to 2021 to be able to really tell you because he only threw the ball 38 times in 19, 32 times in 20. Now, I know 20 was cut short because of COVID, but the 21 is really the, the number that you want to look at here. Um, he goes 224 for 346 
Um, 224 completions from uh, 346 attempts, 65% completion percentage, folks, 65% completion percentage, just short of 2,800 yards, eight yards per attempt, 19 touchdowns, did throw 13 interceptions, but a 142 passer rating, 142 passer rating. To put this in perspective, and I don't mean to pick on Spencer Petrus, he's just the guy that Iowa has has had taking the majority of this of the snaps at quarterback this season, this these past two years. His passer rating in 2020, folks, was 119. His passer rating in 2021 was 117. Okay, so don't anybody who says that he's that oh Emory, I had somebody this morning, and I I respect people's opinion. I appreciate people interacting on Twitter, but I had someone this morning tell me that Emory Jones just ain't that good. Well, he's better than what you got. Okay, Jesus, <laughs> he's better than what you got. All right, now let's go to the rushing numbers, and this is what's really going to stand out. If you look at Emory Jones' rushing numbers, obviously uh, this is no comparison either. So last year he ran for seven hundred eighty-seven yards. As a quarterback, all right, in the SEC, 787 yards on 143 attempts. Now, I understand this is a totally different, totally different style guy, but it is, I mean, like you watch Emory John, I watched some Emory Jones this past year, plays a little bit like Brad Banks, certainly think he's more mobile than Brad was. Brad was mobile, but Brad, Brad was still a pro style guy. Emory Jones would change things. It would be a very uncomfortable. It would be a very uncomfortable um, change for Kirk Ferentz. I understand that, but look, I, I mean, I, I don't know why anyone in their right mind wouldn't consider this, given Iowa's current quarterback room. So that's you know, I did tweet that out yesterday. Do I have any reason to think that? Um, I was going to pursue Emory Jones. I don't, but I just thought it'd be uh, unique to mention because basically every other quarterback has been gobbled up. I know JT Daniels has not made a decision. I don't believe yet. He's reportedly down to three schools, Iowa, not one of those. And I really haven't pined for him either. Um, but uh, Emory Jones is a guy I'd look at if I'm Iowa. Chances are they will not, but uh, I guess we can, we can, uh, we can dream, right? There's nothing wrong with dreaming. All right, folks, um, appreciate uh, this, J Chase. He says that he was used as his own read QB. So, yeah, I didn't really was not uh, aware of what Emory Jones did prior to this past season. I like what I saw to him in the bowl game. Who'd they play? Um, South Central Florida. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he likely he will not be here. Um, but, uh, again, I just don't know why you wouldn't at least entertain the idea given the current status of the quarterback room. All right, folks, I think that's it. Um, appreciate everybody hanging out for a while here. Hawkeye Hangout here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Wanted to just check in with you for about an hour, run through my top five losses. If you missed those top five, you can certainly go back and watch those uh, once this video posts and once it goes final. And I will be here tomorrow. As you will know, if you're an Iowa women's basketball fan, Iowa versus Creighton um, Sunday at noon central time. All right, so 12 p.m. I'll go ahead and pop this up on the screen so everybody's aware. Iowa post game following this game, and the game's actually going to be an ABC game. How about that? Iowa Creighton on ABC at noon Central Time. Thank you, Hayden. Appreciate that. Uh, noon Central Time uh, for Iowa and the Blue Jays from Carver Hawk Arena. Spot on uh, in the Sweet 16 on the line. Likely going to be an Iowa Iowa State rematch, although the Cyclones have a game to play tomorrow as well. But I will be with you live following the game, taking your calls, taking your chats for Iowa women's post game. We will talk to you soon. Appreciate you hanging out. Have a great evening.